always have to be the guy until Hudson. Contact. Where's Jim? Said she'd be here. So. But we'll just we'll just hop along and get all that. So I'm going to call us to order. And note this is the uh, committee on rules, orders, appointments, and ordinances, and that's a mouthful. And this is our September 22nd meeting. We are now in session. I see we're all here. So I'm going to announce that Pam is taking notes. North Street is videoing us from the front side. Comcast is videoing us from the back side. So I think we're 100% covered. <laughs> but just to be aware, every you word for word, you'll not just be paraphrased. You'll be covered in two directions. So um, do we have a motion to approve our minutes from July 14th? Uh, so Second. Second. Any discussion on minutes? All in favor? Aye. Aye. So we're going to kind of hop around um, on our agenda a little bit till Carolyn gets here to address the uh, public hearing stuff. And we have some appointments and some other things to do that will keep us busy for a little while at the very least. Um, so let's do our appointments first. We have a new appointment to the housing partnership. And I think <coughs> I'm going to find my notes from last time. Who was going to I, call? I, I spoke to. Um, Thank you. All right. Was it um, successful interview? And, uh, ab absolutely. She's, um, she has experience um, in this kind of uh, in this kind of work with a number of, of internships and also background in city planning and I think just the dedication to the job. So I, I think she'd be good mm -hmm. on the housing partnership. Do you want to move approval of her? Yeah, I, I move for uh, approval. Second. I'll second that. Any more discussion on this one? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So now the Arts Council. Um, I spoke with Mr. Zuckerman. You did? And I could speak to his appointment if you like. Sure. Please. Okay. So uh, you all have had a chance to see the application from Jonah Zuckerman, who's uh, been now in Northampton for a few years, moved up here from Brooklyn, New York, where we're very active um, in the community in a kind of public art respect and can be credited for much of the changes in those parts of that um, section of, of Brooklyn. Um, runs a, a worked for many years in an architectural firm and now does uh, furniture design in a uh, workshop in East Hampton, but is very interested in becoming more active in the community. Um, had actually expressed interest not only in the Arts Council, but also in the planning board. Uh, his um, well, I'm sure he'd be you know, a great asset to any board that we have in the city for all his strengths, clearly, uh, um, given his educational background in design and architecture and real uh, love of art. Especially interested, he said, in visual arts and um, art. And a, a, a real fresh uh, view in Northampton, having really not much understanding of the background and history of the Arts Council. In some ways, I thought that that's actually a really, can be a, a real benefit to can use that board. So I speak highly of his appointments to the board and would move to recommend the positive. Okay. I, have a second. I see his choices were the Arts Council or the Planning Board, and I think yeah. we're doing him a great favor of putting him on the Arts Council. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and doing the city a favor. And doing the city a favor, too. All right. so. Um, all in favor of Mr. Zuckerman? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, the next two I spoke to, I spoke to uh, uh, Herbert Hank Ross. He <coughs> is one of the two infamous Ross brothers. Uh -huh. he, he and his uh, brother Robert were the infamous Ross brothers. There's only one now. But Hank is actually in the real estate business now. Though he still does in, antique things for particular clients. And he was raised in Massachusetts, but he's lived here like 37 years. So, and he's actually um, been kind of like an associate member there for a while. So he's been around that board. Um, 
he and Bob are friends, so he was quite a, he's been quite involved for a while, and it was a very good interview, so I would recommend him and move him for approval for the Arts Council. I'll so second, second on that one. Any more conversation about Mr. Ross? All in favor? Aye. Aye. And then uh, Jean Paul, I also spoke to. Um, he is also from New York, but from Yonkers, same area. He's been here a year. And only selected the Arts Council. We had a very nice conversation, and he has quite a resume. He's working, I think, for the Springfield Public Schools now. I think he's in education there, but uh, has clearly had a decent background in the arts, lives in Northampton. And based on our interview, I think he'd be a fine member, so I will move we approve his application as well. Second. Okay. Any more discussion on Jean Paul? All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. And then who called Cassandra? I think one of us was supposed to call Cassandra. It must be. Uh, oh, well. Wasn't. Uh, you know, I hope it wasn't. I know, and, I, I, knew I, had, I, knew that, I had Mr. Zuckerman's. Actually, in my is Cassandra a new one? She wasn't on our list from last time. No, she just came up at, at the um, last meeting. This last meeting. Okay, so, okay, so she is to be contacted mm -hmm. by okay. us. Okay. Right. okay. Right. Um, I'm happy to do so. Well, okay. actually, if you like, you could. We have a street. She might be. Oh, but that's. Is, I don't mind speaking to her. She's one of your constituents. I think so. Yeah. Nice to have Because I noticed, I'm looking at the old agenda, too, and those were from our previous meeting. The only other one um, from our previous meeting is Ellen um, from Crescent Street. And I think we. we I've spoken to her numerous times right, about this. And, and I think we needed people. to vote to approve her, but I think everybody knew her well enough in her time on that committee to yeah. not need to call her. So do you want to move her? I would move gladly Ellen on that mm -hmm. second. second. Okay, any more discussion on Ellen? All in favor? Aye. Okay. And so the rest of them then, the Rec Commission and Cassandra are new. So we need, we need to call them and either offer them the chance to come in and visit us or just interview them on the telephone. Um, Julia Chegan, I know very well. Do you want me to have a conversation with her? Julia, okay. I'm happy to. Good. I know she's out of the country for a couple, of maybe long, at least a couple mm -hmm. of weeks still okay. in Rwanda. Well, then I, I'm happy to call Yvonne. And then do you want to call Alexis? Yeah, I'm happy to. All right, so we'll split those three up. So I will call. I'm going to make a note. Uh, I would be speaking to Cassandra and Julia. Okay. And then I'll do Yvonne, and you're going to do Alexis. Excellent. Okay, so that's our appointments from last time and new referrals from this time. So we've got that. I have a quick question, um, just so I know the time frame. Are we meeting again in October 2nd? Uh, 13th, I think. 13th. And that's not Columbus Day? Oops. Okay, I just know that usually the second Monday is Columbus Day. Is it? Yeah, it is. Okay. Uh, would we like to just we need another day yeah. that, that week? Or, or the, the either that or the next Monday. First Monday. Uh, yeah, the next Monday. That be that. First is day. public safety, which ties us up. Yeah, so the 20th instead? Just so, so, we so can, I know. Mm -hmm. I think we didn't have a, we sometimes lose our room to the license commission. Mm -hmm. Let me just check and see what else is. So what are, what are your day choices? The first day is uh, Columbus Day. Sneaky holiday that we can. Mm -hmm. I know when we change nights, we have trouble. So the Committee on Social Services meets on the 20th. At what time? 4 to 6.30. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, we could meet here again. Yeah, why don't we do this? If this, this room is available, we could come over here on the 20th at our normal 5 o'clock time. I can't. Oh. So oh, you have to go over there. The oh. um, we could tentatively schedule the 20th because I know they have that public hearing on the 14th. Yes. On the 14th. So I don't know if they're still planning to have this particular meeting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can we go to switch days and just do a Tuesday or something? Is that too rapid? Hold on a second. Just, uh, we need to check and see if we conflict with anything. Mm -hmm. that and for me, I have to just take a mm -hmm. quick look and see. If so, so like maybe on the 14th mm -hmm. instead. I know. I can't. Oh no, the 14th is that hearing, so I can't. Oh, of course. Yeah. Uh, 
we want to just look at that week, that 15th card mm -hmm. to 16th constantly. I think we're better off trying to stick to that Monday, the okay. 20th. Um, and see if they're, to see if they're meeting, because that would make the most sense to do it, just do it the next Monday. And then everybody's free as long as they're not. We could bump up our time. I know that would be back to back for you. I don't care about that. Well, because we'd like be saving you. Like they should be at 6 instead. Cause do they usually go to the full 5 to 6? <laughs> yeah. They do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, How about at 7? I know that's a lot of That's fine for me. I don't no, it's, 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 we stay up late, so. The 20th at 7? Why don't we schedule it for that day and then confirm the time. Okay. when they're meeting, because if they're not meeting because they just had, they just had their hearing, then we can slip forward, but if not. Okay, so I'll say I have it right now at five, and then if, if we have we'll to. We'll kick it up to seven. six, it's 6.30, right, when they Yeah, you gotta get let her get a, a cup of coffee. 6.30 to seven? Yeah. yeah. All right, you'd rather, I'm deferring yeah, to you, you'd rather go right at 6.30? Yeah, that's fine, 6.30 would be good for me, but, you know. We'll change the changeover, and then we'll kick it up to five if, if there is no meeting. Okay, so will some of this depend on whether you have a public hearing scheduled for that night? Oh, we, we will days? definitely. Okay, so, so um, I don't know if 6.30 is a good time for public. everyone else who needs to participate. Mm -hmm. Well, not the public. Oh, Carol. Well, it yeah. will be. It is what it is, and she theoretically is going to be here. Okay. So we can check with her um, to see if that works. Okay. Yeah, to see if that works. So either 5 or 6.30, depending. I'm sorry I, I put us into that topic. I was just trying to figure out what our time frame then mm -hmm. for me to bring back a report around Cassandra and Julia. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the that really takes us up to everything that's on our agenda for public hearings. Well, can I point something out? I, I believe items 10 through 16 are not part of the public hearing. That would be one of them. I think these are all like oh, yeah. fictitious parking and uh, the plastic bag thing. Yeah, I don't think they're part of the public And we have to we have to postpone we could just uh, postpone the plastic bag thing anyway to go out and take that last. It's gone to lots of different places. So. We want to just continue we we'll obviously continue that well, well let's just start on ten and go through. Yeah. Then. And some of these things are things that you have expertise in because they would have come back from transportation. Or you guys might sponsor them, right? We'll, we'll see if I do. Okay. So, um, we, well, let's just continue and get them out of the way. Um, so, 312 80, the bike lanes on North Main Street and Prospect Street. That mm -hmm. came from you. It did, yep. Uh, 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 yeah, it, it, uh, I think it I got them over received here. the positive recommendation from the Transportation Pardon Commission. It essentially adds two new stretches of, of bike lane, one along Prospect Street and one um, up on North Main Street uh, towards, you know, towards Leeds. And um, it's kind of funny because they already painted the Prospect Street. <laughs> <laughs> so we could choose to go no and then, uh, but uh, yeah, uh, uh, these, these are two new bike lanes along uh, important routes. So that's why I received a positive recommendation. I, I would move we approve. Mm -hmm. Second. We have a second on that. Is there any more discussion on the two bike lanes? Then all in favor of a positive recommendation say aye. 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 Good. Good with that one done. And then uh, parking, this is 312-102, parking prohibited on all times on Main Street Florence. I'd like to move we take 10, excuse me, 10 11, 11, 11 and 12 as a group. Okay. Because they do the same thing. Uh -huh. Would you want, do you want to, why don't you move them as a group and we'll get them seconded later. Then. So I move uh, those okay. as a group? Uh, second. Okay. So that's 312-102, 312-104, and 312, no, other parts of 104. There's two 104s. Okay. Well, okay. I, 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 I want to move. Yeah, so yeah, there's, there's, yeah. The ones I want to move are 312, 104, 312, 102, but only items 11 and 12. 
only items 11 and 12 together. Those are different. All right, and we have a second for those. So go ahead if you want to, again, because they come sure, from your absolutely. other committee, you know what they're talking about. Absolutely. So basically this um, first uh, changes where parking is prohibited and then designates one hour parking along the same block in Florence in front of Cooper's Corner. Mm -hmm. Right now you may not know that it's actually prohibited to park in front of Cooper's Corner. <laughs> Where the, where the parking spaces where are? Where people actually park, yeah. And yeah, there's marked spaces. And, and yeah, and there are marked spaces. So we uh, put into law that it's not <laughs> illegal, <laughs> and you may park there Can up until. What, what yeah. was the, um, was it prohibited at some point for some reason? It is, oh, I don't know. I mean, yeah, the history of it, I don't yeah. know if it was prohibited at some point. Could be just like the streets that weren't streets. Exactly, yeah. The streets that weren't streets, some of our. That nobody oh. knew about it. Okay, so it's not right on uh, Main Street. Yeah, okay. it, it, it's right on Main Street, yeah. and right in front of Cooper's where people park. So it essentially undoes the prohibition and designates those spaces as one hour parking spaces to conform with reality. Mm -hmm. so, that's going on. so I think it makes sense. Mm -hmm. I, I would uh, move those two. Okay, we have a second for those. Any further discussion on those? All in favor of a positive recommendation? Aye. Okay. There you go. And now we have the next two. Okay, so that's 112-104 and 112-109. And um, this, this is a big one. Yeah, the, this is interesting. These two go together as well. Basically, um, unlike other parking designations in the city, like handicapped parking spaces or, as you just saw, one-hour parking 15-minute spaces are not written into the code. They were just kind of administratively designated. Um, so this would change that and then enumerate where all the 15-minute spaces are in the city, um, which I think is appropriate. Um, that should be in, in the code of ordinances rather than said administratively. So what you have is a list of all these pretty much downtown 15-minute mm -hmm. uh, spots. And those are designated under the limited time parking set schedule. Mm -hmm. And the companion one simply um, adds the phrase, unless otherwise specified, um, when those stretches of, of parking spaces are in different parts, different uh, you know, lengths of time. For example, on the street, there's two hour parking in some of it, um, except for the 15 minute spot. So that creates that exemption. Um, hope that was clear, but they, they come together. Can we just, is that one yeah. of our pieces here? This, you want uh, to take a peek? Well, I got one. I just want to see which one. Oh, I see. It's this thing here. This, two, this stapled one? There's a stapled one. Yep. And it's on the bottom. It's 14-219. Right. And then 14.220. Mm -hmm. So they codify where all the 15-minute parking spaces are. Mm -hmm. On the bottom of this chart? On, no, the on the bottom of the, the document. Agenda? Of the document. Yeah, because one of them is just all the 15 minute spaces. I know that. Yeah. Sorry, I just got so many here, it's hard to tell which one we're referring to. It is a stapled one. <coughs> okay. Um, and, at the, and the footer down here yes. is 14.21. Yes. Oh, okay, now I see that. Yeah. Exactly. And the companion one is one page, and it's 14.220. Okay. Yep. And then the other So I, if I, you know, please let me know if there's any questions so I didn't describe that clearly enough. So that's the purpose of these uh, So we have all this 15-minute spots, and all this is doing is placing this in the yeah, correct spot. Codifying. The yeah, they just didn't appear in the codes before. You mean as, uh, mean as specific locations? <coughs> exactly, yeah. We didn't have any 15 minute spots in the code. They oh, were just okay, so, uh, and so my question was um, again, when these became enacted, the 15 mm -hmm. minute spots, which is probably five years ago? Or six, oh, longer than that. Uh, um, I think it was with the understanding that these would change from time to time mm -hmm. based on merchant needs. A lot mm -hmm. of them were uh, enacted so that. Yeah. So I, I, I wonder codifying them as such, well, it just means every time there might be a change based on, you yep. need to just need to go in and add a location or exactly. delete. 
And a good example of that, that's a good question, is Main Street Cleaners recently moved. Right. Not far, but down the street. Um, and so that, that would be reflected in this uh, schedule. We had to change those 15 minutes. Uh, yes. Actually, by uh, adding another, yeah, we're scary. Oh, so we added one and, and we um, are keeping the one. And we're keeping the other, I think, three that were on the other block. Okay. And the one that was in front of Main Street Cleaners will remain. I think, yeah, I think there were, I think there's actually three there, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, and it will remain. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. As I recall, Mr. Latender at the time thought it was a good idea, so we just put up the signs to see if it worked. Something like that. And it worked. But yeah, we never right. had any ordinances to support them. Right. And right. I think that was a problem. But now we do. So those were moved and seconded, correct? Right? I moved them. I moved them. Yes. I'll second it. They were second. Okay. If there's no more discussion, all in favor of, of those two? I say aye. aye. Okay. Positive recommendation for those two. <coughs> And then we've got 312.99, number 15 on our list, violations and penalties. <coughs> Happy to explain that as well. Um, That's this one. This was a suggestion that originally came from Nancy Forsall, who brought it conceptually to the Transportation and Parking Commission um, with regards to how much the fine is for legally parking in a handicapped parking space. The state range is $100 to $300, and that was updated by the state, I don't know, fairly recently, in the past five years, I think. And that this is another one where we didn't actually have a fine set in law, we just administratively decided it would be $100. So this does two things. One, it sets the fine and clarifies it a little bit, and it raises it. Our fine had effectively been $100. Yeah. We're raising it to 150. And regionally, if you look at other communities in the area, we're low. Um, Amherst, I believe, is 200. Greenfield is 200. I believe South Hadley is 150. So we were on the lower end. Hoyoke is 300. So that's what this does. Just sets a new fine. As I recall, um, there was, I'm not sure if it's put into the legislation at all, but I think it was understood that our collection of these fines would be reused by the committee on this Yes. Okay. Exactly. So does that mean, do we have that? They, we did that already. Just a matter of policy or it, is it something that we Yeah, they, we passed, we gave them that permission. In fact, at our last meeting we gave them like a $1,500 budget, as I recall, so they could, they didn't have to come back so for $100 theory. to <laughs> right. okay. get a banner or buy coffee or something. I don't know what the mechanism is where I buy the money is transferred. That's right. must be in a different area. Must be separate. Yeah, yeah. this is just an enumeration of different penalties. Yeah, because yeah, we had to. I remember when we react, enacted the statute for that, and in fact they had to redo the committee, as I recall. They had to, in order to get the money, you had to have your committee conform with the state statute, mm -hmm. and we didn't. So we had to change oh, our committee okay. around. But we're we're good now. So. We had to change our name. We had to become a commission. Yeah, from a commission to a committee. We had to uh, match the state laws requirements. Yeah. So. so now these are commissioners, not just oh. Thank you. So they're they're good. And I, I don't know, 150 dollars. I mean, parking in a handicapped space is one of the nastier things people do. I mean, those are special places for handicapped people. All right. uh, I'll second that. Um, okay. Any other discussion on? on uh, just I, I put 150 to start with to be kind of conservative in terms of the fine, in terms of raising it, and I thought the Transportation and Park Commission should debate it. I was sort of surprised there wasn't that much debate about the amount of, mm -hmm. of the fine, but they were fine with 150 dollars. So that, that was the explanation. Mm -hmm. All right, and it'll go back to council so if council feels like yeah, it right. should be another number then crank it up and we'll rank it up. Absolutely. Say the max is 300. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll see what Councilor Barge does with this one. Okay. Um, all right, all in favor of positive recommendation on this one? Aye. Aye. Now, 16 looks like it, it, it's gone other places, right? right? That just got referred, so we couldn't be ready for that one. I don't know if So the solid waste reduction, item 16, yes. was only sent to us last this Thursday. And that went to other committees. I think continue yeah, it? Yeah. Okay, we would continue it to our next meeting on the 20th. Uh, second. And then you just 
just uh, wait for the other committees to. Right, so we just continue at each meeting until the other. Until they're all done. It's going to be yeah. a year. Oh, could be. Okay. okay. And that way, Pam just kicks it on to our next agenda. All right, all in favor of continuing that one? Aye. 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 And then we also should continue the um, the plastic bag one. I don't know which. That's what we just did. Was that it? Yeah. Oh, that's it? Okay. There's the fancy name. It's just one name. Solid waste reduction yeah. environment. Sounds like a fe federal legislation. <laughs> the, the, it, with a name doesn't sound anything like what you're doing. There's a preamble too. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it, actually, the ordinance is thicker than the Constitution. Okay. <laughs> Councilor Adams worked overtime on that. Okay, so that one's done. So now we find ourselves. Uh, do we need to do public comment for the regular part of our session? Um, we sure could. Is, may not be necessary. If anybody wants to do general public comment, we're about to open the public hearings on the zoning, which is, I think, what everybody's here for. So I'm assuming nobody wanted to make a quick early comment and then exit state. Unrelated left. to that zoning. Unrelated to the zoning. It's looking like that's what everybody's here for. So, um, so we'll go back to page one. And we'll open our first public hearing. Or I'll accept the motion to open the public hearing on um, Amendment 350, uh, 350.12.26 Lighting Standard Review Assessment. Move to open the hearing. Second. Okay. All there? Aye. Right. So, is there anyone here? Well, actually, let's have Carolyn comment on it first so we all know what we're talking about. And then we'll take public comment on it. So 12.6 is a proposed amendment to, um, well, it does two things. One is just um, provide in writing um, what the building commissioner already does, but um, he felt like it was important to have um, some clarity for people who are looking in the ordinance um, um, about his jurisdiction to ensure that projects are meeting the current light standard. So, um, the ability for him to point to text saying that he can go out, make his own assessment, and if the, the property owner doesn't agree with it, the recourse is the property owner can provide their own professional assessment and they can work out the details mm -hmm. um, in order to achieve compliance. So it doesn't really change anything in the ordinance, it's just um, he felt more comfortable having that clearly identified. The second piece of it is um, that um, a, a standard to require that site lighting for projects in um, business districts be turned off one hour after the close of business. Um, we're not talking about building lights or entry lights. This is really parking lot lights. Um, and the reason this has come up is that many times the planning board, um, the planning board approves, goes through site plan approval, and might attach a condition. That's sort of been the standard is to attach a condition to a site plan approval saying, well, once your business is closed, there's no need to have your whole parking lot lit up for the entire night. Um, so an hour after you're done with business, they should be on a timer and be turned off. But it's been, the planning board has to remember <laughs> to add that to a condition, so sometimes they haven't. So we have these sort of um, um, irregular standards across the board. So this is really just to say, you know what, we don't need lights on all night long for businesses that are not um, open. Quick question, of, of course that wouldn't apply to uh, present, presently operating businesses. It's only for new plans? Or new uh, no, it's for all businesses who have big site parking lots. So, so yeah. for example, so stop and shop lights will go off now at 1 a.m. or whatever, an hour after they, they close at midnight. So. Right. Oh. Mm -hmm. So how does this work with like an auto dealer where they're prone to losing, you know, 25 airbags in the middle of the night or getting their catalytic converters cut off? Have we got comment from the police department as whether they want for security purposes to keep some of these places lit up? Um, no, but we some auto dealers, as they come through, we've had permit conditions that say you can't keep your site lights on or you can have minimal site lights for security purposes. I mean, that's basically an um, um, a sort of, I would say, more of an administrative function. You could put timers, sensor, um, you know, motion detectors on lights. 
so that they come on if there's if there's motion detected. Um, so there are other ways to deal with that, but no, I haven't checked in with the police department about car dealers in particular. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that would be my the only interest why people keep lights on is to, for security purposes so that when the police go by they can see the perimeters of the buildings. And I know they do ask you to even on businesses leave interior lights on so that if they, you know, if an alarm goes off and they walk up to the window they can actually see inside, see if things are disturbed. So. Anybody, uh, I don't gather this was the one you're all here for, but <laughs> anybody want to throw in any public since you are public, we don't sometimes even have one. <laughs> any comment on this one? No, I don't hear I, any. I think it would be good to check with the police for security purposes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And domestic violence and all kinds of things. And we could, uh, we can certainly do that. Just we can, uh, with no other real comment, we can close the public hearing on these and then send it forward and we can have that comment for uh, for council when it shows up. Let me read the two paragraphs that they're going to insert, just we haven't read them, and I'm sure the folks watching the North Street side will want to know the content. Um, we are on 350-12.2-6, and the two paragraphs that this would add to the ordinance are, the building commissioner shall determine if light levels are being met. Based on this assessment, the property owner shall replace or modify fixtures to achieve compliance. And I believe this is the ordinance that talks about spillage of light off-site or away from from the buildings. Is that true, Carolyn? Because I know we have in our ordinance splash from lights yeah, and we're We don't about. allow light levels to spill over on property boundaries anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's really just the the level of illumination as well as yeah, they're, they're mm -hmm. misdirected in some way. Okay. Yeah. And if the property owner disagrees, they can get a lighting engineer to come measure yeah. the light and say, here, we are in compliance. Right. Right. And then the other one is on the one we just talked about. All site lighting not attached to the building itself in business district shall be turned off one hour after the close of business and or up until one hour before the opening of business unless otherwise approved by the planning board through site plan review. Right. So, so 24 hour places can stay lit 24 hours, right. but if you close, you turn your lights off. Right. That aren't attached to the building. Right. And if you are a car dealer and you feel that you need to have some special um, consideration because you want motion detection to be able to go on in the middle of the night, you could also get that through planning board approval. <coughs> the way it's written. Okay, so any more public comment on this one? Well, just uh, I, I think it addresses concerns that residents have who live so close to the uh, commercial districts and feel affected by you know, light pollution yeah. all throughout the night. So I think it's a good attempt to address some of those concerns as well as energy saving concerns. Mm -hmm. the, this, <laughs> this says, unless otherwise approved by the planning board through site plan review, so that would encompass security concerns and that kind of thing. Right. So mm -hmm. there, I don't get there'd be any need to spell out with an amendment, you know, what those possible, possible security purposes? No, it could be any reason. So if as any much reason. of the lighting ordinance is that way. If you want to have something different that's in, in the ordinance, you can apply to the planning board and mm -hmm. say, here are my circumstances, mm -hmm. can I have this? Oh, and I'm sure the police department could come in and say, listen, we're having such a hard time with these car dealers. We'd like you to let them leave their lights on because, uh, of, you know, make a case for that and the planning board can deal with it. Okay. Then if there's no more comment, a motion to close the public hearing on this one? So. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And do we have a motion on this one? I would move to send it with a positive recommendation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I would second that. Okay. Any other discussion? My only discussion was that we do make a point of soliciting the Lieutenant Police Department's opinion. Mm -hmm. All right. Then all in favor? Aye. Aye. And then the next one uh, we have a public hearing to open for is to amend 350-10.10b detached accessory apartments and that was referred to us on September 4th. So do we have a motion to open that public hearing? So moved. Second. Okay. Correct. All in favor, we're open. So Carolyn, you want to talk about this one? Yeah. So um, we have a so we have um, two provisions for accessory apartments. One is a by right accessory apartment if it's part of or with incorporated within the single family home. 
the detached accessory apartments are um, by special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals, and um, they still need to meet the same standard setbacks, and they've always had to meet standard setbacks as a principal structure. Um, when we revised the ordinances for three of the districts last year, A, B, and C, um, when we moved tables around, the reference to the setback was um, eliminated because it was in one section of the ordinance but not in the special permit section. So this ordinance sort of goes back and clarifies what's always been the rule, which is that the principal, uh, that the principal structure and the detached accessory structure have to meet the same setbacks. And um, so it's just adding a sentence within the special permit um, section that specifically um, addresses detached accessory apartments and it would say the building commissioner may issue a zoning permit authorizing installation and use of an accessory permit within existing or new owner-occupied single-family dwelling, and the zoning board of appeals may issue a special permit authorizing the installation and use of an accessory apartment in a detached structure on a single-family home lot when, and this is the additional se um, sentence or phrase, when such structures have the same setbacks required for principal residential structures and, and then the rest of it continues on the way it always was. <coughs> so, our sample public, any comment? On, any comment on this one from from uh, the assembled public? No. Any comment on this from yes. ordinance members? So, for example, if you had a garage and you wanted to convert it, but it was five feet from the property line, it says you can't do that. Right, and it's never been the case. Never. And that's the way it is in all the other residential districts, still in the tables that we haven't messed with. Right. So our RSR, and um, I guess those are the only two other residential districts we haven't um, modified yet. Yeah. But that's the standard there, too. But what you Thank can you. do is, is work with them in the same footprint. Not for residential use, no. You can't convert a non-residential use to a residential use if you don't meet the same setback mm -hmm. as for a principal structure in that district. Mm -hmm. Because detached garages and things are what, like four feet or something? Right. Very so close. So we have much closer, right. For a, for a garage garage. Right. So those you can't convert. Right. But you could build new, or if your existing carriage house or what have you, garage, was the setback in that district, then you could convert that. And then this would be... I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut. You could convert that garage into anything other than a garage? You, you could convert the garage to a residential accessory unit yep. if it met the setbacks for residential units in that district. Right. But we typically allow workshops, garages, any sort of accessory structure, sheds, to be closer to property lines because there is no living component to it. So the question is for the for the garage that is, you know, four feet away from the property line now. Yeah. It, is there anything that the resident can do with that piece of property beside that structure besides a garage? Uh, storage. So not right. They can't right. convert that into a right. living unit. And it's work. never been that way. Or a workshop, or right. you know something yeah. other. Okay. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Okay. So it still requires a special permit. Any more questions on this one? And last call, any more public mm -hmm. comment on this one? Move to close it now. Second? Oh, I'll second. Okay, excellent. All in favor? Aye. And then a motion? I move uh, positive recommendation. I'll second. All right. Any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. Excellent. Okay, we got that one done. So now the moment you've all been waiting for. <laughs> and. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'd like a motion to reopen the continued public hearing uh, from June 9th and July 16th. And this is on 350G, replacement of the moratorium for seven or more units in B and C. Um, and 350H, replacement of the moratorium for construction of several, seven or more units in C. So there are two different ordinances. So we to reopen the public hearing. Second. Second. Okay, all in favor? Um, and before, before we get going on this one, I want to let you know <coughs> that 
we're going to spend some time discussing some of new amendments that the good counselor from Ward 3 has come up with based on the meeting he had. But we have been asked by the housing partnership, right here? No. Yeah. we've been asked by the housing partnership to continue this issue to our next meeting because they want to put a position together on it as well. So in all likelihood, we'll discuss um, what Ryan is going to pass out tonight that came from that last meeting. But we will continue it one last time because the housing partnership wants us to take input from them as well. And how they somehow missed this, I don't know. But we'll honor that. We'll honor that request. So um, what I thought we might do to start off is let, because this is, I think, new information to many people, uh, is to let Ryan explain what his proposed amendments are, and then we'll open them up for public comment. And uh, But please do remember, we're probably just going to be continuing again until our meeting on the 20th, when the we'll 20. hear the position of the housing partnership. October 20th. What? The 13th is a holiday. Oh, yeah. Columbus, Columbus Day. Day. So it'll be the 20th. But that will give you even more time for. Does that mean it's going to be here instead of council chambers? Um, we don't know yet. If, if we, it may be at five over there if the, uh, no. Social services is that day. Oh, I thought. If it is going to be the 20th, it will likely be at 630. 6.30. Okay. Unless council of ours chooses not that meeting because she just had Because she'll have just had one previously. It will be the 20th, okay. so. Um, Council, you have the floor if you want to explain the, the and, and I'm assuming this is new information. I mean, it may be something that you saw at that meeting that Ryan had a while back, but we'll let you explain it and then we'll take on it. Thank you very much. And um, I, I might also add that the Energy Commission is also taking an interest in the energy part uh, of this ordinance. And, and as Carolyn knows, they, they may to have some feedback to provide in this period before our next meeting. Um, so just to put that out there as well, but I'd like to start by describing the, um, the two-page document. Um, this is one that if you went to the forum earlier in the month, you'd be familiar with. It's a simple reorganization amendment. Um, its purpose is to clarify and make this ordinance easier to read by grouping it into sections. And the sections, as you can see, are buildings and parking, streets and roadways, park space, environmental energy, affordable housing. And other than that, it makes no substantive changes, it, but it groups all the different bullet points, of which there are many, into these um, five sections so that each can be discussed uh, more readily. So that's what that amendment is. Um, building on that, I, I have three here that I, I have discussed with the planning department and they kind of build off, you'll see that I, I use my own, it's presumptuous of me, but I use my own headers. Um, um, the, the first one simply maintains the moratorium to the end of the year. Um, I think when we enacted the six month extension, a lot of people thought that meant the moratorium was here to stay until the end of the year. And there was some confusion when we spoke of simply replacing it with these recommendations. I think I think these recommendations for special permit um, for special permit application are coming along, um, and we're making progress on them. But I think we should still maintain the moratorium to December 31st, not remove it. And as a practical matter, I just point out that I don't think anyone's building in the winter anyway. So um, that's why I recommend keeping the moratorium to December 31st. So essentially, this ordinance would become effective. Because exactly, that would be the same. Yeah, the effective date would be next year, mm -hmm. rather than the moment we pass it. Um, the second amendment I'd offer has to do with park space. Um, as you can see, it it increases the amount of, of park space that was contemplated before from a minimum of 100 square feet to a minimum of 150 square feet, or the increase would be from 10 square feet per dwelling unit to 15 square feet per dwelling unit. So it just says there should be more park, uh, park space. And secondly, it says all of this park space sh 
should generally be contiguous unless there's a really good reason for the planning board to waive it so you don't set a bunch of mini parks that you aggregate together and to, uh, you know, to meet that requirement. You have as much contiguous open uh, park space as possible. That's what that means. Um, third amendment is um, there's two parts of it that relate to streets and roadways. I'll just read it. That'll be the simplest way to explain it. Um, it adds on a number four, which reads, vehicular, vehicular access shall connect to surrounding streets as appropriate to ensure safe and efficient flow of traffic within the surrounding neighborhood and to mitigate increases in traffic on nearby streets. And to me, this is um, a tool the planning board will have to help make decisions um, to do exactly that, to, to mitigate increases in traffic and ensure the traffic flows effectively, which I think is an important thing to do. It certainly was something that was discussed in the forum earlier this month. Um, the next one is, has to do with pre-existing paths that have been historically used as bicycle, pedestrian trails. It asks that they, when, when, when possible, they be preserved and marked with signage. Um, and that was another specific suggestion that came from the forum uh, earlier in the month. Quick question, is that section be a new section? What I'm working on, that's a good question. Yeah, um, thank you. To, to clarify, that's why I was saying I was being presumptuous. I was sort of amending my own amendment, which hasn't <laughs> passed yet. Um, okay. But yeah, I grouped all of the, amend in, in the first two page amendment, yeah. I grouped all the points that have to do with streets and roadways and to be. And yeah, and then I had two more. Oh, mm -hmm. that's part of the reopening, as part of that reorganizing committee. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, as a matter of procedure, if it's possible to amend but keep it here, or you know, whatever mm -hmm. your pleasure. Well, I think what I might, because these have not been to the solicitor, I assume. I, um, he's been copied on it, but yeah, it's safe to say I don't have he's a been there. Where so it might be since we have the luxury of not having, you know, of this and uh, Mike, we. Uh, preface this by saying that we are going to continue this to our next meeting because the housing partnership wanted to weigh in in the meantime and they don't have a meeting till the beginning of October. So the seven or more zoning in BNC is going to live another month. You know, we're, we're continuing the public hearing tonight. We'll continue it one more time. And uh, so th these might be things, and I know Carolyn, it might be nice to get the planning boards, I mean, because we have the time, get the planning board to weigh in on this, get the solicitor to weigh on, in on this, and decide how it would get integrated if we if we so, you know, amend. Well, my only question on that is, that's if I can ask a question, would we have to reopen the planning board hearing for that? No, because um, we'd amend it. You know, we might be just looking for their opinion, because they're the sponsor. So I'd be very interested, you know, I don't want to cut them out of the process because they've done a lot of hard work on this. And I always feel bad if, if they get the feeling that ordinance sort of willy-nilly chops up things that is their purview after they've seen it, especially if we have the time to send it back to them and say, what do you think? But if they give us positive feedback, I just be, you know, at that point, we could put it in there. Um, and I, I don't know, Carolyn, do you have an opinion on this at all as to how they'll feel about it? Well, these things, I don't think, I think you're just, I look at them um, as sort of more tweaks and, and further. And substantive um, changes. Right. <clears throat> so I don't think there would be an issue, and I, and I don't think it needs to reopen a public hearing. They've finished their public hearing. But they can always, you can always seek feedback from any committee as you're doing with a mm -hmm. housing partnership and decide whether to take their comment or yeah. not. Yeah. So, you know, we can certainly take it as an administrative or, a, you know, just mm -hmm. an agenda item. Okay, just to comment on it, because we're still certainly doing public hearings, and if we amend it here, then it's getting a public hearing. Um, so, public comment time. That, that's the new stuff we have for you tonight, but feel free to comment on anything you want about the previous <laughs> version of the ordinance or the amendments or anything you, you'd like to comment on at all. Madame Lafarge? <laughs> So essentially, it means, it means yes, exactly, knitting away while the head is rolled. And essentially, it means that, that the council won't vote on this now. I mean, there was some idea that out of here would come some recommendation, and the council could vote to either continue or discontinue. The, the, the council, yeah. Now they won't vote till October. 
not till yeah, after our meeting right. in October. Okay. Yeah. And our goal was always to get this done by the end of the year. So I would hope, 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 please, planning and everybody, that we, we get this out of here at our meeting on the 20th, which gives November, you know, gives four meetings for council to to get this through, which I think is reasonable given all the process that's happened at this point. But um, that would be our goal to get it done and passed. And if it's not effective to the beginning of the year, that's probably okay. Um, yes, sir. So, um, so I, I have a question. Oh, just for the for the My home name group, is just Jim identify Nash of we, we know you. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, first of all, um, I'd like to thank Ryan and for Gina Louise for holding the hearing. That um, that that uh, that that was actually the first hearing held on the zoning by City Council mm -hmm. uh, or anybody on City Council. That, uh, all of the other discussions on zoning had been held through the planning department um, and through various committees uh, like the ZRC or uh, mm -hmm. the, through the planning well, we, but we had two public hearings prior to that. Yeah. Through, this committee. Committee. Yeah. through this committee. Yeah. But I, in terms of just having a, right now we're, we're very restricted to talking about this particular ordinance. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the, those other meetings, the, the, there's a much broader Mm -hmm. Reach well, and, and those two counselors are probably the most affected. Their jurisdictions are probably the most affected by this. Well, so. which brings me to my presentation. Which is where most of the, which is where most of the C is, at least, which is the most effective, which is in Ward Three. And four. So, what I I just like to do a quick. You're not going to hit us with that, are you? No, 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 no beatings tonight. So, um, so Jim Nash, a member of the ZRC. Um, and that um, we worked on dimensional standards. Um, so the dimensional standards that got approved by City Council last year um, um, allow for 50 feet of frontage and they allow for um, a 75 foot of depth. And, but the lot still needs to come up with what is 4, it? 4,500 per unit. Per unit, but it has to be 3,500 square feet minimum for a lot to. Well, if you multiply 50 by 75, you get 3,750. Right. For a single family house. Right, for a single family. So to start, you need that much, okay? So, but for, for the purposes of this, what I want to talk about is just take a typical lot size. Um, and so this is to talk about how the zoning works right now. So what we push through with the 50 by 75, okay? But, so I, I took what could be a typical lot on like Forbes or just about anywhere in town, okay, with 75 foot of frontage and 80 feet in depth. Mm -hmm. And what you see, and I call this the receiving area, this is where you can build, okay? 15 foot, so theoretically, this is just about how it would look. Um, and on, on a property like this, you'd be allowed to put in two units. Most people are comfortable with that. And the reason it works is because it's, it's only 80 feet deep. The problem is that once we start getting around 100 feet deep, it still kind of works, but things start to break down. That you notice that the receiving area starts to elongate into the property itself, which is different from the traditional way that everybody want, is expecting our zoning to work. They're expecting that it's going to be nice and green and everything's going to be up, and, up if on the street. Instead, what's, what's going to start happening is that we're going to start having infill deeper into the lots. Now, this is only 100 feet. This is very typical throughout Northampton to have this kind of frontage and this, this kind of depth. I, I'd say a majority of the properties are this or bigger, okay? Um, now we're starting to get into properties that are typical yet large. And these exist throughout the city. We, we know them, we, we walk by and say, oh, that's a great house. Look at the great backyard that they have. 
and that we see through it, you'll see um, um, Florence, Bay State, um, uh, between Prospect and Elm Street. In fact, many of the properties on Elm Street, they all start to fall in this range. And that, so we're talking three units that are allowed by this dimension. Many start to get up into this 150 range. Um, I, if you just open up the, the, um, the zoning maps from the planning department, you know, look at Bay State, look at, look at Florence, especially any of the properties outside of the immediate downtown Florence area, just two streets out. If you look at, um, here, I'll just want to read you a quick list of the streets. These are URB. By the way, this is URB, not URC. Um, in Florence, North Maple, Lake, Beacon, Nonatuck, South Main, North Main Street, Oak, Sheffield, High Street, in Bay State, Hinkley, Warner, Winslow, Federal. Um, in, uh, then there's Massasoit and Crescent Street. There's North Street, there's Henry Street, there's Orchard Street, there's Montfield. Now, this is a list, a survey I've done in the time while waiting for you guys to go through your first part of the meeting. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I could do a much more intensive search of streets where these kind of properties, these especially, where we're starting to look at, do you see the receiving area? It's no longer what we're thinking of as Northampton with a home up here on the street. We're inviting infill into people's backyards. And, um, and that I think that before, I think it's critical that as this moves forward, that we keep our eye on this. Because this is, this is, you know, if we do a nice overlay at Lyman, people are gonna be happy, all right? If we, if we, with the bigger projects, we're gonna get a lot of people showing up and people will be involved. But it, if something goes in on Hinkley, or if something goes in on, you know, North Maple, the phone calls that are going, going to come in when, how did this guy get away with putting five units? This is a street of single family homes and maybe two family homes. And the thing is, this is what we're allowing. This is, this is my backdoor concern with the new zoning. So I'd like to see this on the table as this goes forward. Carolyn, do you have any comment, half comment on? Jim, can you leave them up there? Oh, sure. so, yeah. It's a good visual. And do you have any particular comments? Um, I, yeah, I mean, we started, we looked at um, the whole idea of addressing these core neighborhoods is to say we need to grow more sustainable. Sustainably, we know where, um, we know there's demand for all sorts of different units, and the place, the appropriate place for those to happen over the long term is where we have existing services and existing infrastructure. It, it reduces costs to everyone, environmental costs, infrastructure costs, mm -hmm. costs to the city. Um, so there are some lots that are of this size. Um, there are many lots, as we went through the analysis last year, that aren't this size but yet have two and three families so they're not conforming and you could never do that again on different lots that might have the same size. Um, so the, um, again, this piece, less than seven units, isn't on the table for public hearing tonight, but we certainly looked at that and we said, as a community, if we were gonna grow, uh, or if we're going to provide housing, in fact, we haven't grown in population, we've declined in population, but where we need new and smaller units and where the demand is, is walking distance to downtown, Florence Center, needs and that kind of thing. So um, the other piece of it is, there's still the 40% open space, the, the um, lots that um, Jim mentioned are in the urban residential B, which require 40% open space. So in fact, you're not gonna be building in that entire inner lighter green <coughs> area because you still need to meet 40% open space. Those meet 40% that I've drawn these out. These are, you know, based on, you know, I use some graph paper that, that the setbacks actually are the open space and that, that there's a certain point where the open space requirement will impact that receiving area, but it's gotta be a significant amount of property. Mm -hmm. 
Um, the, yes, what's on the table is seven or more, but I want to emphasize that seven or more is a political number. It's not a number based on any planning recommendation or any anything that came out of the the, the, the the ZRC, we came up with different numbers. We were talking about for, for URB, we talked about three or more. That's, seven was just to make this whole thing, you know, to divide it up and be able to get it through. And what I want to get on the table is that yes, we're talking about four units here. There's a, there's a property across the street from Alex Giesland. It's, a, it's an acre big. We're talking 17 units across the street from Alex Giesland. I think he'd probably have something to say. And that the, the, the number of properties that, so the threshold for 17 or more, or for um, seven or more is, is around 17,000 square feet. There's lots of properties that big. We know of those properties. You walk by them and people have big gardens in their yard and they have a big porch out front. So I could have kept going. I, for brevity, I stopped. But it, I, I could definitely keep going, and I, I could draw up any number of these things, and I'll, if the, any counselors who want to sit down with me, and I can. Mm -hmm. But the, the receiving, and I don't want people to think that, that the receiving area means that you could cover that entire thing with a structure. You still have to accommodate parking. You still. Right. I mean, there are things that have to go in there. All of. But it removes all the green space. So within these formats right here. Mm -hmm that uh, within the first three, uh, a driveway actually doesn't impact the, the amount of the receiving area. It's only once you get up to this, this larger area that now with the receiving area has to figure out how to accommodate a driveway. Mm -hmm. Which and is part of the reason it works with the smaller properties. But you still have to block out parking for a requisite number of Yeah, you gotta put space. in parking, you gotta put in a driveway. But this is, that entire area is it, it's transformed. Yeah. It's no longer a garage and a, and a garden, in fact. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Council. Um, thank you for, for making these illustrations. Um, as you go left to right, it sounded like you were kind of okay with the one on the left. Well, I think it's it's it, on the far left. It indicates like like how. How we got to the zoning that we have, the dimensional standards that we have right now, kind of work for right there. The problem is that within Northampton, we have we don't have our properties. Many of them are actually quite deep. I know. So, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. So, on streets where the properties aren't deep, mm -hmm. the new dimensional standards work. Okay. So on the left. So, like that could be Forbes or Washington. So on the, on the left, you're kind of okay with what's on the left, and as you go over, you're less okay. So I'm wondering, where where exactly is the line, and then where the line is drawn, what is the fundamental quality that is is the problem? Is it just the number, the sheer number of units that can be put there? It's it's the the style. There's going to be a whole different way of type of infill going in on these properties. They're not, we're not going to get a traditional four, a, a four family up on the street. We're going to get something long that extends deeper into the property. And that, so for somebody on Massasoit Street, where they're used to looking, sitting in their backyard and looking over and seeing their neighbor's yard, they could see three or four more units extending into the yard. And they lose the privacy of what was their backyard. So, okay, so it's the number of units. But it's not just the number of units, okay. it's the way it affects the, the private space. The, the private, so public space is up against the street, private is behind the structure, it's where the backyards, you know, it's where patios will be for condos and all of that kind of stuff. By, have, by allowing this sort of infill, we're going into backyards. And not just the backyard of, you know, of said property owner says I'm going to build, everybody around them is now affected. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And yeah. just to tell us who we are for... Yeah, for sure. Day. Jane Potter, 42 Phillips Place. And I think specific, because I know you probably want more specifics, Ryan. Um, in addition to what Jim's talking about, the concerns are public safety, traffic flow, 
um, parking, infrastructure of streets, width of streets, they're all different. Um, I think you've seen a couple of letters to the editor this week about the changing culture of the neighborhood. Um, someone else wrote about um, just the, the walking in the streets, a land planner, Dylan Sussman, about how you know um, people don't walk on the streets in his new neighborhood because the sidewalks are in such bad condition. But it's about it's about the culture of the neighborhood, traffic flow, parking, access. Mm -hmm. um, Michael, you take it. Yeah, uh, Councilor Murphy. I realize. <coughs> okay, I think what you said about Madame Lafarge <laughs> is was out of order, <laughs> and, <laughs> and you probably owe her an apology. <laughs> Well I, well, I will assure her we won't take off any heads tonight. It was a reference to the knitting. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's right. Yes, that's that's, well, that's where it came from. She's yeah. knitting up here. So. Well, the heads roll. I'm not well, well, a I give, you, I give you six points. Uh, yes, please. Jim, would things like some of those Elm Street design standards that we've discussed, that we've discussed with Ryan, address some of these concerns? Because they give the patterns of lot coverage. Um, Proportionality of the proposed structure versus the ones around it, massing issues. And it seems to me that starts to get at some of these concerns. Um, structures that are much higher, perhaps like two stories, three stories higher than the ones in the area around it, things like that. Um, is that, is that design standards far could up? be a way. I, I, I think there's, I think there's two things. There, there could be the design standard discussion. But I think the, the more fundamental discussion that needs to happen is do we want to grow like this? And I don't think anybody in Northampton gets that this is how we're going to grow. Mm -hmm. Because if we're going to grow that way, Adam's right, we need some sort of plan as to how this is going to happen so it's not like the planning board's got to think it out every time. Oh, uh, we have, you know, they don't know and it's not clear in here what they're going to do if something goes in on, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and Please give us your correct identification. I know I was representing Claudia. Claudia Lasko Lafarge, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Forty Valley Street. Well, I think you know Ryan. What what he's got up there is what exists on the left. This is what it looks like: a, a house on on the lot with these setbacks. Mm -hmm. um, and and then in response, Carolyn, to um, to your comment, you know, people. Yes, the idea of infill is to. I think. We're very conscious of sustainability and people living downtown and stuff. But what does it doesn't it doesn't speak to the issue of at some point these things will happen and people will be driven out of Northampton completely, not to a suburb or a river or whatever, but because you just the, the environment that brings us here has to do somehow with this viewscape that is more green around us, and so I feel like. The, the challenge, you know, is to find a way to keep Northampton viewscape very, um, very, very friendly uh, and and also green, you know, while also infilling. I mean, I just look at this little infill project on the corner of Pomeroy Terrace. I don't know if people, uh, Ryan came and Jesse came on this walking tour of our neighborhood, and there is a detached condominium set and all this green around it, which doesn't make any sense to me to have the green around it. But, and it's not an affordable place. It was like $500,000. So for $500, somehow, no matter what the language is that we're you're <coughs> behind it, it, it doesn't feel like we're translating it into, into what's on the ground for people that we understand. And that's why, Jim, this is very, very helpful because I think, like a woman from who owns a property on Holly Street came walking by and started talking to me about zoning. And she has a three story on Holly Street, those lots, they go back just like the arts trust building way back. She said, I guess I could probably put more buildings up on my lot as well. So I mean, there are these places where we got, haven't even thought about this lot, what it would mean to build that long. So thank you, Jim, it's very enlightening. Please. Yeah, um, Jane Potter, 42 Hope Place. Um, and I just wanted to say that I completely agree with infill, but what we worry about, and I think that that $500,000 sale, I don't know who bought that, but a <laughs> um, little crazy in that location. But unfortunately, what it does um, 
offer as a portent is that we're not, the diversity of the neighborhood is going to change. We, we love this neighborhood that has all kinds of apartment buildings and has had creative infill happen already with beautiful old houses turned into rooming houses and apartments, and they are affordable. Um, and any new development, unfortunately, if there's, if, in case we get specific language around it, um, it's going to gentrify the whole area. Uh, and, we're, and it's going to change the demography of it, too. It's just going to be older, rich people. Um, mm -hmm. And we worry about that. Adam? Um, I wonder if another way to pull together some of the concerns here is when you get a larger projects, seven or more units, to increase the open space requirement. Because I think, you know, one of the things that certainly I'm, I'm worried about when looking at Tim's charts is like, you just kind of wind up really eroding the tree canopy in these overseeding areas over time, which is not in a sustainable and natural sense. And so, one way to counteract that and I think mitigate the digital impact of these larger projects is to say, well, we need 50% open space if you're going over seven units. Um, and that starts, it might make it look more attractive and more acceptable to the neighborhood and really start to counteract, push back against some of these problems we've identified. Oh, please, again, you haven't had a chance to speak yet. <coughs> um, I'm Julie Carros. I live at uh, 30 Monroe Street, um, which is Ward 4. I'm, I'm, since I'm the only Ward 4 person here. Yay. <laughs> compelled to. <laughs> um, and, They're very um, accepting from Ward 4. <laughs> <laughs> I know. That's great. Um, so, I, first of all, I, I just want to say thank you, Ryan, for um, clearly the, incorporating a lot of the neighborhood concern um, that, that came up at the meeting that you ran uh, a few weeks ago uh, with these amendments. And, um, and, and the ward, a number of us at, uh, in Ward 4 who have been uh, talking and meeting about these issues are, obviously we're particularly concerned about the development of the Lyman Estate property. So I, I just like to, and that's, you know, that's a seven plus, um, that would be a seven or more unit um, development potentially. So I just want to echo, first of all, what Adam said, that I think um, a, a big concern is is that the density that would be allowed is is just too great for the neighborhood. Um, and, y you know, and that, that speaks to traffic concerns. Um, our streets are already overloaded, we feel, with, with traffic. Um, that would just increase the traffic. Um, and, and also I think specifically the, in the seven plus um, ordinances, the height allowance is, I, I think it's higher than it should be. It's 50 feet. Um, and also the, the, the square footage allowance, I just think allows for too much density in, in an area that's been, you know, it really is one of the most beautiful green space, it, well, it's actually not that beautiful right now because of the way Smith treats it, but it's um, potentially a beautiful open green space close to downtown. Mm -hmm. All right, any other comment at this point? Again, remember that we'll, oh, please, Jim. Thanks for listening to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. And anything I can do to, you know, further this discussion around this concern I have, mm -hmm. let me know. Mike? Yeah, I'd like to thank um, I'm call it Commissioner Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> Your Excellency will be fine. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. For, uh, being responsive to, to my ideas. Thank you. And one, so one more comment over here. Not very, are you okay. Careful? Carolyn, you had the. Uh, I, I do, actually. I just didn't want oh, to. Oh, please, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, Jane Potter again. I just was going to respectfully request that since there's some. Um, a little bit more um, input coming from housing and from energy concerns that we might possibly take this time to look at best practices of other communities just to see if there's something we can learn from for good info. Uh, Carolyn? Yeah, I just want to follow up on the Elm Street Historic District guideline. Um, so we couldn't just copy and paste from Elm Street because that's very specific to Elm Street and the purpose was to preserve um, a historic district that's recognized on the um, National Register and has all these other contexts that are outside the zoning. And that's a real 40, I mean, that's a state 40C. Right. Has to match their cookbook for what those are. 
So, and, but we do have similar elements already in the zoning and that they've been worked through in the seven plus units, which is on the table now. So we've got issues, we've got massing and um, there's general language, there's specific massive in the design um, criteria for all units, but in the seven plus category is what we've been working on for the last year and a half through many public processes, um, which many of the city council are part of, but um, to um, create more specific guidelines um, that are they would address multiple neighborhoods because we don't have, um, you know, all not all the neighborhoods, we're a very eclectic um, city and there are very few neighborhoods where you have a um, similar pattern throughout the entire neighborhood ranch houses next to three-story Victorians um, with turrets and things like that. And that all fits into the neighborhood. So that's, um, you know, we, so we can't just copy and paste from a historic district. Um, so, oh, please. Uh, I just have um, a, a question that I think has come up in a lot of neighborhood discussions um, that when we think about, you know, a, a space like Lyman Estate, um, and, and the development of it, it's it's hard to have a context or a framework for, for thinking about it because we don't, nobody really knows how many units could actually be built there. So I, I don't know if it would be possible for, um, you know, planning department or, or, or somebody to, to really tell the residents how many, what is the most number of units mm -hmm. that could potentially go there under the, the new ordinance. Well, I think one of the problems is Smith has not yet been specific on exactly how much of it they're going to get rid of, right? Because they're going to keep at least the middle of it, the old Lyman building, perhaps, and their new school. And so, we don't even know that. <laughs> so, so there's the housing in the front yeah. and then their physical plant dumping ground in the back where they may get rid of that, but th they haven't told us exactly what is going to become available for development yet. Th that's true, but it, I guess even even knowing, you know, like saying taking a theoretical part of it, uh, like, like let's say from the carriage house back. Or yeah, or we did that in February. I don't know if you went to that meeting, but we we basically took what we think is probably a market assessment of what would likely go in mm -hmm. that sort of. And then we took a chunk of the existing South Street neighborhood and applied it to that and tr tried to do some numbers. I don't remember the, what the number was off the yeah. top of my head, but it was a couple of blocks of very similar housing, you know, two and a half, three story homes that might have one or two units or mostly, I mean, it, it, the, it really depends on the market. It's, not, it's probably gonna be a very similar uh, market to what's on South Street, but we tried to do that as best we could without knowing what Smith's plans are for which part of the property they want to sell, you know, and that seems to be evolving on what they've told us that they don't know either, so. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I do re I do remember that, I did go to that meeting, I guess I I saw that as, a, you know, this, this is just, this is what's, this is an idea um, as opposed to that's sort of the max. That's all we can do, really. Mm -hmm. Until they actually come what forward and say, here's what we're going to serve us and say. What about Shaw's or St. John's Cantius? Do, do we have numbers? Shaw, um, I don't know if this channel I mean, Shaw's clearly is going to be something different, but St. John's Church, it's... Shaw's 12, 15, yeah. yeah. And then the church, I mean, it all depends on what happens with the church that the big behemoth that, mm -hmm. you know, people are trying to figure out what mm -hmm. to do with it. And Remember too that that is going to have to go to historic commission if they're going to demolish it, and that's another whole can of worms. Actually, it's not. No, it's not. <laughs> no, that's central no. business. Oh, that's yeah. Oh, central business. Right. But it's still, and the thing about central business is, unlike unlike the historic commission, central business's authority is permanent, no demolition. So if they don't issue the permit, it doesn't come down. So. Is the um, big deal mark as you call it, <laughs> in Shaw's? Are they continuous or no? No. Yeah. There's several properties in the Yeah, yeah, they don't get angry at each other. All right. Any other comment? 
and again, what we're going to do if, if we're set for tonight. Carolyn, you have anything else? I just was going to add, I mean, a lot of this process has been looking at what communities have done all over the country. You know, we're not working in a vacuum. We definitely look to see what small size, medium size, big size cities have done. So we've grabbed from those that seem appropriate. Can you share that with us? Is it listed someplace? Oh, we, no, we haven't listed. We picked and um, um, I can go back and through my notes and see what I grabbed from, but there's some West Coast towns, some... Um, I think the neighborhoods would find it really helpful just to know that that was done and to know a little bit more about it. Thank That's you. That's kind of how we work. So. All right, so if there's no more for tonight, then can I get a motion to continue this public hearing on 350G and 350H to our next meeting, which is looking like 6.30 on October 20th. Okay. All in favor? <laughs> okay. Thank you all Thank for you. coming and following up on this. We'll meet again. <laughs> and uh, just to keep us on the table, that concludes our posted agenda for tonight, right? We covered everything. Right. Except for a call for uh, new business that we did not reasonably expect would come up. Anybody have any of that? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And those, you can have souvenir copies of those. <laughs> um, <laughs> organizational thing. Yeah. Okay. All right. Then thank you all. Um, a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.